Welcome to Taking Stock. I'm Amanda Lang. Coming up on this show, there's new money on the table for health care, but the problems maybe aren't all solved with cash. And we're told there are plenty of jobs out there, but are they good jobs? Plus, a class action against Johnson & Johnson's talcum powder business moves ahead. What that means for Canadian plaintiffs, that's all ahead. First, for the week that was in business, it's time for the briefs. The picture for jobs in Canada is still a strong one. The economy added 150,000 jobs in January, 10 times expectations. Most of those jobs were full-time private sector jobs. Meanwhile, wages still rose firmly, though the 4.5% gain was down slightly from December. For the first time, the Bank of Canada released the notes from its recent governing council meeting, where the decision to raise rates rather than pause was debated. The argument in favour of a pause was to give previous rate hikes a chance to work their way through the economy. The five-person council noted there's likely to be a dampening effect on the economy as some Canadians renew five-year mortgages at much higher rates. The federal government is offering to top up the health transfer to provinces by $46.2 billion, plus an immediate $2 billion aimed at unclogging backlogs in ERs, diagnostics and for surgeries. It brings the federal share of health spending up to about 24%. That's far shy of the province's aim of 35%. Still, the expectation is they will agree to take the money. We want to uh, move forward on this as quickly as possible. We feel a huge sense of urgency to deliver care for our constituents. The world's largest energy companies are reporting big profit and in most cases renewing plans to invest in future oil production. Last week Exxon posted a record $56 billion in quarterly profit and upped its plans to invest in its future while spending on a shift to renewable energy. Collectively, the world's largest energy firms issued $115 billion in shareholder dividends last year. Bed Bath & Beyond is hoping to ward off bankruptcy and this week took the unusual step of selling stock and raising $225 million. The retailer has been struggling for months and hopes to raise enough new cash to buy it time to turn the business around. Canadians think they need $1.7 million in savings to fund their retirement. That number is 20% higher than it was in 2020. The study, conducted by BMO, also found that just 44% of respondents are confident they will have enough to retire. That is 10% lower than the number who felt confident in 2020. And those are your business briefs. Well, this week, the Fed's offered to spend billions more on health care in the years ahead. But is more money really the answer to the problems? Health is intimately tied to financial well-being, housing security and mental health. Are we overlooking a place to make a big difference? Andrew Bazzari is a primary care physician and the executive director of Population Health and Social Medicine at the University Health Network. Thanks for being with us. Thanks so much, Amanda. And I wanted to talk to you specifically because we keep throwing money at this problem, and I know there are parts of the system that could use it, and we have staff shortages. There's all kinds of things that money would help with. But you actually deal in a place that goes to the heart of strains on the system. ERs are clogged with people who need basic care because they don't have proper housing or they don't have proper mental health supports. What are we getting wrong about some of these basic social supports? Yeah, I think, Amanda, you've really laid it out in terms of how we've we've not really seen how this is all connected in terms of our health and social policy. And it's actually quite sad because when we look at where Canada was on the world stage, when it came to better understanding what we call the social determinants of health, which is really what you've spoken to in terms of the air people breathe, the jobs they have, whether they have access to housing or they don't, and the social connections are much larger drivers of health outcomes than some of the conventional access to primary care visits or imaging. And we actually knew this back in 1974. It was the, one of the first reports on the world stage uh, by then Minister Mark Lalonde about the health of all Canadians. And it was very clear in the uh, minister's report that if we did not actually pay as much attention to the social structures, the social supports and things from education to housing, we would not actually see the gains that we were all hoping for just within 10 years of passing universal health insurance. So, I mean, obviously, that is there's a tragic uh, story in there. More money, of course, always seems to be the answer here. You you exist. Your your whole practice here is about making these connections. What would you like to see to make that more broad spread, so that that actually becomes the the entry point for our thinking and our spending? 
Yeah, we have to be very concrete on this. I think you mentioned we, this is not innovation when we keep operating in silos, with both within healthcare and the social sector. So in terms of someone as a primary care physician who kind of works at the intersection of hospital and community, it's very clear how hard it is to navigate both the health and social care system. I know tonight we're going to have hundreds of people who will not be able to access a shelter here in downtown Toronto. We'll have to resort to emergency departments uh, or public transportation because there was nowhere else to go. And with the wet weather or cold weather, there are far worse health outcomes. And that is, one, we are failing on human dignity. Uh, and two, it is actually a very, uh, very inefficient when it comes to health economics in terms of how we have to be thinking about the societal opportunity costs and how we're spending. Right. And so one, if we're not going to ensure that people have access to housing, we know that this is far more expensive and it is very cruel. When you look at the fact that um, a month in the hospital where I work at could cost over $30,000 uh, for someone to come in a conventional stay, that may even be a conservative estimate. And then when you look at even the sheltering system with the city's own data suggesting it's close to seven thousand dollars a month when supportive housing costs from twenty five hundred dollars to twenty eight hundred dollars a month we are failing both on sound economics and the kind of you know improvements of health that we want uh, for everyone in the country and we now know that there's tens of thousands of people across yeah. the country who aren't going to have that tonight. Seconds left here, Andrew, but we're billions more being spent. There should be a sense of urgency around our healthcare system. It is in crisis. I think we can say that. This should be the time for these kinds of solutions. Are you worried that we're not seeing them now when of all times we should be? I'm worried we're not seeing enough leadership in the the type of deals that may be coming into place. We cannot have a federal government abdicate the role in healthcare, and we cannot see both from the provincial or federal uh, counterparts, it be simply about cutting checks. More money alone is not gonna solve this issue. It has to be about the leadership and accountability and collaboration across sectors. Uh, and again, it's, it's actually about both and. We need to increase health spending. People, one in five uh, Canadians do not have access to primary care. And we also know that there's you know tens of thousands of hundreds of thousands of people in the country tonight who do not have access to stable housing. So we really need to ensure we're working on both fronts in concert. And if we see a leadership void on this, it's hard to see how this gets better fast or how we get out of this cycle of despair and poor health outcomes. Andrew, so good to have you with us. We really appreciate it. Thanks so much, Amanda. Andrew Buzari is, a, is Executive Director of Population Health and Social Medicine at the University Health Network. Coming up, we hear a lot about job vacancies in Canada, but where are those jobs? Stay with us.